So I started off this whole music thing when I was uh, a kid. I got my first keyboard for Christmas in the mid 80s. And I wrote my first song when I was about nine or 10. More about my reasons for such in the documentary Roots and Veins. <gasps> when me and my mum moved to Norway, I continued primary school in Badum, where I met a dude called Ura. Both of us were pretty heavy into our music early on, so we soon became best mates and uh, started our first ever band, a synthesizer duo called Shaku. Heavily inspired by Jean Magenjar and the Commodore 64 game The Last Ninja. In my early teens, I started taking the train from Schleppen to Oskit a lot, which is the neighboring commune to Badum. Before I knew it, I was singing in a bunch of bands over there. The first one was called Inedible, which uh, we managed to spell wrong, even though we did actually find our band name from flicking through a dictionary. Me, Didrik, Daniel and Christian practiced pretty much every weekend in Daniel's basement. Shout out to his mum, by the way, for putting up with us. Fun fact, I started singing in a band because uh, none of the other members wanted to. Not even me. To be fair though, we did end up sounding a lot better than we did in that very, very, very early footage you just witnessed, if you ask me. Oskid had a really tight-knit music community going on in the 90s. So many great people that have influenced what I do to this day. And for that, I'm forever grateful. You take away the painting and now you do it slow You haven't got a clue about the length that I would go through Just to I often miss those days, really And I miss singing in a band band like this one called Obi-Wan Stronger, stronger and then A little weaker We used to play gigs at uh, Club Tre all the time which was, you know, the best underground scene in miles distance, if you ask anyone that hung out there in the 90s. You know, when uh, everybody wanted to be Eddie Vedder. So sweet is the sound When a bell's chiming inside your head We started getting a few write-ups in the local paper and uh, booked some gigs that we actually had to go out of town to get to. We made two albums that we released ourselves, Nose Job and Thoughts on Hold. We started off as more of a funk pop band, ended up as more of a rock band towards the end really. Shout out to Brikt, Martin, Peter, Öystein, Guy, Brynjar and our sound whiz and glue and times uh, Yassa. And then there was Yelp. We were pretty hardcore. This bright light here is André Bach. He's the guy that involved us in making the soundtrack for the world's first bass jump film, First Bass. And the sequel, Second Bass. André and his crew uh, Uslo Bass introduced us to that particular extreme sport, which was only just rising at the time, thanks to people like them, really. And, um... <laughs> it just blew our minds. <laughs> had been a 
at it for a few years already as a band when I humbly joined forces with them in the mid to late 90s. We had two singers, Paul and myself. bands I really miss playing with them. Paul, Einstein, Tommy, Magnus and Cash. <sighs> when we got into that zone, man. It was ours. It was freedom. We rented a house together and it was in an industrial area so we could make loud music day or night and there was a lot of love between those walls and it was all the perfect setting for a lot of creativity. We played in a few small clubs and a couple of bigger ones and we played a couple of festivals, a few snowboard events. We pretty much had the time of our lives and I love those fuckers to death. But you know what they say, this too shall pass. So, um... Uh... But I wasn't quite finished as a musician or a songwriter yet. I feel I'd only just found my voice through, uh, like singing-wise, through all these uh, different bands and projects and everything. So uh, it was time to uh, dig a little deeper into my expression otherwise, musically. go at playing the drums for the first time, which I loved instantly, even though it sounded pretty wonky. After a couple of years, I had recorded enough demos to start putting an album together. Now I needed a live band. Whenever I see these guys today, it really brings back some good times. Found my day by a riverside. See these fingers out and flipping all kinds again. We practiced twice a week for a few years, and in between practices, I would usually be preparing more stuff for the next practice. I often think about how privileged I've been to have guys like these put in all those hours for my music and ambitions. We played a few gigs, mainly in and around Oslo, before we headed for Larsvill, a studio in Stubidol, to record my debut album. Marta Valle was working with Paul on her debut album when we arrived at the studio. Hello boys. What are you doing over there? Delicious. Dishes, it's rock and roll history in the making. Paul is from the north. He's one of those guys that gets things done. A real Mr. Fix-It. With a good ear for sound, I might add. He was a really great fit for me in the band and ended up engineering, mixing and co-producing my first two albums. Sist. This was also my first time as a producer with other musicians involved. Anyway, 
Finally, I was recording my songs in a real studio with real people and real equipment and real coffee. After a few takes, new methods began to take form. We're going to store that from another cool effect. Okay. <laughs> we have our own cooler. You ain't going to do shit, okay? I'm doing shit. I had just started a little label called the Tooth Fairy Label with uh, two mates and a dentist called Guy. Tadja and Klaus came up to Stugadolm to listen through what we'd been up to in the studio, and it got pretty wet for a dry summer's night. The band was in the studio for a couple of weeks before they headed back to Oslo. I stayed behind for another week or so myself to record the rest of the album. Marte also came back to finish her album that weekend and we recorded a song together at some point I believe but I have no idea where or how it went which is pretty unfortunate. After everyone had left, I spent my hangover writing and recording this track that kind of came out of nowhere and ended up being on the album. The album got some good reviews and people actually started to notice what I was up to a little bit. For my second album, Shrink the City to a Light, I went back to Larsfield again. 
Just me, Paul, and Alfred the dog. I played every instrument myself this time, except for a couple of tracks that Paul laid down, plus I introduced a horn section to my music for the very first time. Exciting! Shude and Bendik had come up to Stugadolm from Oslo to record horns on one track only, Silk. We enjoyed it so much that I spent the whole night arranging horns for almost every other song left on the album. Shoot and Bendik barely had time to record everything before they had to head back to Oslo the next day. And I'm really happy they did. My second album got some good reviews and even more people noticed what I was up to. Lite sån internationell svunga av namnet, men ja. norsk som god som någon som halvbruns ja. brunos. <laughs> ja, ja. Jag får hitta bakom den. Den är far min är engelsk och mor min är norsk. Mor är norsk fortalt. Two thousand and eight was looking pretty bright, to be honest. Our little label was getting out there a bit, and I was about to sign with the booking agency. Two singles from the album were listed on NRK Petre. Three songs were on the soundtrack for the movie The Orange Girl, Appelsin Pekin. There was a new manager in town too, Martin. That's when I got the honour of supporting Leonard Cohen at Bislett Stadium in Oslo. Man, what a day that was. Meanwhile, back at the booking agent's office, because of a sudden crash in the world economy, it was decided that I could now forget about touring anywhere with my band. I had to start thinking about hitting the road solo, and I'll tell you, I fucking hated the idea. So... I went to Africa instead. Sometimes I can get so caught up in an idea that I can't sleep properly if I don't bring it to life. My mission to start playing concerts solo without my band was so scary to me that I decided to walk up to the top of Africa's peak, Kilimanjaro. The idea was that if I could stand there at the top of the world's highest freestanding mountain, then I should be able to get my ass up on stage alone too and continue what I love doing the most. One thing was getting up to the top, but I'd say the mission felt accomplished when I set foot on this stage, just me and my guitar. If no one is snoring, then I'll just snore with myself, and then I'll just keep going where I slept. Hello, 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 First of all, it's not the kind of show I had been picturing myself on at all. I had already passed judgement on the whole idea before the first phone call from the production team came in asking me to join their first season. A call that ended with me politely declining the offer. Then a sudden turn. I would be a proud father in nine months. My best production, I might add. Then Mung Nifuda Holman from AHA announced he was going to be one of the mentors that season. And I was sold. You see, when I was a kid living in Bahrain, I remember being in the car with the whole family, Dad, Mum, me and my older brother Bjorn, when AHA came on the radio for the first time. I looked up to my brother a lot when I was growing up. I still do, although he might not see it as much these days. I could be a bit of a pain in the ass when I wanted to hang out with him if he had friends over or if he just wanted to be alone in his room and listen to music. It would usually come blasting straight through the wall and into my bedroom, where I'd be playing along on my keyboard. When our heart played on the car radio that day, it was the first time me and my brother agreed on anything. Instant fans. 
So working that close to Mungna after all those years was quite literally living a boy's adventure tale. It seems my trip to Africa might have paid off quite nicely. Here's a song I wrote when I got back. I was born a ray of light Gone lost in the darkness And in the back of my mind Then is a fear that I won't do it again And the world's too big To just stand in the doorway And just because I have a mind Doesn't mean I gotta use it all the time To go and do it again Oh, oh So that's pretty much the story behind my choice to audition for The Voice back in 2012. And also the reason why my only live album so far, Oslo Solo, is kind of extra special to me, I guess. After ending up in The Voice for the long run, I started getting a lot more gigs all around the country. Some solo, some with my new live band. Me, Sven, Jan Tore, Arvid, Jan Tarik, Shur, Bendik and Vidar. My dream these days is to go on tour again with those guys. That would be pretty awesome. years went by from releasing my second album to releasing my third one and life took a few twists and turns in between.
which also meant I'd been writing new songs. The studio version of the single Dragon on the Plane was recorded with Sven at his first studio, Odden. We've become very close and worked closely ever since. The plan was to record my third album, Green Means Walk, Red Means Run, at Odden. Until we got an offer we just could not refuse. Three days at the legendary studio Ocean Sound. Mm. So me, Sven and Arvid headed down there as soon as we could. <laughs> ocean Sound is situated on an island called Yiske, right next to the ocean. Hence the name. Yiske might not be the most populated place on earth, but man do they make up for the quantity with their qualities. One of them being house technician Henning. favorite studio in the whole wide world. We were in need of a horn section on pretty short notice. Luckily a local one down the road was available for the job. We had a couple of late nights and uh, <clears throat> various ideas. I've always put a lot of work into my demos at home and when I've taken the songs to the studio I've pretty much stuck to the plan. With this amazing atmosphere going on in and around Ocean Sound we allowed ourselves to play around with some different approaches to a couple of the tracks.
flat again. People run into the air, never come back again. About a year later or so, we went back to record and mix the rest of the album. We played a few gigs around and about in Norway. One of my favourite parts of life as a performing artist is discovering new places full of people I didn't know about, then ending up never forgetting about them. And I genuinely do love my audience, however big or small. And although I often let them know how much they mean to me and how much they actually inspire me to keep on going, I often wonder if they actually know. I think so. Million dollar production. Sometimes I make music for film and TV. It's important to me that the project feels important to me. Like this film about a young girl that gets cancer and how she and her friends have to deal with it. Or this TV series about my friend Petit and his hike through Norway with a group of drug addicts looking to get on a better track in life. Good times. I made an appearance in a drama series once called uh, Nuben. Thanks to a performance of Saviour Unknown on uh, Gudruten, the title track for a series called Eyevitna that I wrote with two talented dudes called Bent Orsru and Geide Bernen. I've done a little of this and a little of that along the way. Uh, I've always loved creating projects, you know. But my biggest project to date is my fourth album, Roots and Veins, that I released earlier this year. I recorded the album with Sven at his new studio, Klokkerant, in Jøvik. Quite a few steps up from our days at Odden, to put it that way. Sometimes awake from these broken dreams So getting around to finally recording an album together was even better now that we were here. Sven also mixed and mastered the whole album at Crocodile. When Covid-19 and the pandemic cancelled every concert I had planned for 2020, I decided to head for the mountains again, only this time a little closer to home than Africa. More specifically, Rendalm, where I spent a good month filming my documentary music video mountain trekking album film, <gasps> Roots and Veins. Life, what are you about? And do I get to figure you out? Me, a puppet on a string, or something worth singing about. You and I. Of awards. How about that? People keep telling me that everything will pay off in the end for those that stick to their guns the longest. Do I still believe that? Hmm.
I wonder. Why? No time for hurricanes and a little dog in my... <laughs> <laughs>